uh, physiological contexts. So this whole thing started co completely um, on, on the wrong foot because um, what we like to study in the lab is the relationship between how the genome is folded in, in 3D nuclear space and how this folding affects or is affected by function. Um, and in order to do that, we thought that it might be interesting to look in a, a, an aging relevant context. Um, and the reason we, we thought of that at the time, and I'm, I'm talking roughly 2013 now, is I had in my head these pictures. These come from patients that have progeria. So this is a, a, the, the nucleus of a normal fibroblast from a normal uh, individual, um, so a non progeric one. And this is one from a person that has a progeria syndrome. And you can see just by eye, you can see a huge difference in the relative distribution of DNA and the focal distribution of DNA in these nuclei. So one would think that, you know, if you were to compare the structure here versus the structure there, there would be massive differences in structure that might explain differences in function. Um, a couple of years later, uh, the, the labs of Wolf Reich and Peter Fraser came together and Tamir Chandra uh, actually used high c to look at this uh, prominent feature of oncogene induced senescence, which is the formation of this very well-known heterochromatic foci that the Narita lab uh, has described in detail. So we thought, okay, all these large changes, maybe there's something that we can contribute and learn from this, because in order to understand the relationship between structure and function, you need to be able to perturb it. So what we did is we said, we're going to focus on repl replicative senescence, and we're going to use the relationship between structure and function there, and how this is perturbed uh, upon entering senescence to try uh, and understand. I should say that at, you know, during the course of us doing these first experiments, uh, there was data from uh, the Neretti and Sedevi labs at Brown University in the US, where they were looking at replicative senescence, but actually at the very end stage after the cells have had been left in a state for, of senescence for many, many weeks uh, and months. And this is the so-called deep replicative senescence. And it's quite different to what we are looking at here. So I always have this slide in, but you know, to sort of uh, explain to people that are outside the senescence field that senescence is a very interesting uh, physiological response of our tissues. I, I probably do not need to say much for this audience, but all I would like to say is the following. Um, it seems like senescence has these two sides that we all know very well of. It has a very good side, a very beneficial side that kicks in early on, especially in development or um, during wound healing and injury repair, which we understand pretty well. And there's another one uh, that seems to have to do with the accumulation of senescent cells um, with age and how this underlies quite a few pathologies. But there's, there's clearly also an aspect that is related to cancer. And now there, there has been quite a bit of effort to use senolytic drugs, for example, in cancer therapy. I will try at the end of my talk to propose something different, actually. So what was our hypothesis in, in our very initial study back in 2013? So we said, what if this very stochastic process of cellular aging, what if it has a deterministic leg to it? What if it is very important early on for a cell that will enter senescence to first take the, let's say, young genome that you see here as a cartoon on the left and refold it in, in, in a way that would be a senescent type of genome. And we call this idea chromosomal aging so that maybe the, the structure, the folding of our chromosomes actually precedes um, the actual uh, entry into senescence. So how we did this is we, we took uh, established primary cell models. So this is um, uh, a Huvex cell, so uh, an endothelial cell that we just uh, passaged consecutively to drive it into senescence. And this is a, a lung fibroblast, an IMR90 cell that you know very often used as models. And we have different phenotypic um, or molecular markers to look at where we are. So how senescent our population really was. Um, we never worked with 100% senescent populations, very difficult to reach anyway, but we wanted to have, you know, we were battling with heterogeneity, but we wanted to have populations that were entering senescence rather than anything else. So when we got there, uh, we had three different cell types. We added a mesenchymal stromal cells to the mix, and we just 
did uh, transcriptomics on all of this, look at gene expression changes, and found that there were 206 genes that were commonly downregulated across all three cell types. And of course, if you looked at the pathways that were affected, you would find things that are exactly what you would expect, like cell cycle regulation and G2M transition, they're all being suppressed, DNA metabolism replication. But there was this, this nice little cluster up here that um, involved genes that had to do with the packaging, the conformation, and the assembly of chromatin. And you can see some of these here, and I'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking about uh, how we to group B1 and B2. These are, our, you know, currently our two favorite molecules. So um, high mobility group uh, proteins are, uh, have been named such because they were discovered as really fast migrating bands on electrophoretic gels very early on, decades ago. And now we know that the HMGB family or high mobility group box family has four members and they're characterized by the presence of an acidic tail and two DNA binding domains in tandem, box A and box B. And they're pretty well expressed across uh, tissues uh, both early on in development, but also in the adult body. Um, they are very conserved across uh, met metazoans. They also have a uh, very high conservation of the actual DNA bind domains. And what is very interesting about them is that they're very, very abundant. So they are the most abundant proteins after histones in the nucleus of mammalian cells. And in mice, we have roughly one HMGB1 molecule for every 10 nucleosomes. This is a huge abundance. And here you can see what a, a slice of um, a Hubeck nucleus looks like under super resolution microscope for, for B2 and for B1. They're really, really abundant. But what happens is as cells enter senescence, they actually choose to empty their nuclei out from both HMGB1 and HMGB2. With, actually with HMGB2 loss happening earlier than the HMGB1 loss. You can see here um, young cells, and this is a B1 staining, that's a B2 staining, and you can see the large senescent nuclei uh, being essentially empty. And this holds true across all the three cell types that we've looked at. Again, this is not uh, new. Uh, other people have described this loss before us. So we wanted to ask, what is it that HMGB2 actually does? And there's a problem. When you want to study a transcription factor, you need to be able to do a chip seek and find where it binds uh, across the genome. But these DNA binding domains that HMGB proteins have are allergic to formaldehyde fixation. So the moment someone tries to, to fix cells and stabilize them on chromatin, they, they're actually depleted from it. So um, it took us quite a while to come up with a modified strategy to actually hold these proteins on chromatin for the most part. It, it is clear that we are uh, underestimating the number of peaks that these proteins have. And you can see uh, some profiles here, for example, along the CCL locus, uh, but we managed to do this. And I'm happy to discuss details of, of our cross-linking approach. The vast majority of HMGB2 peaks are at active genes and active gene promoters. Um, there aren't that many intergenic peaks, and you can find that whenever they, wherever they sit, uh, there is, there's more li most likely is going to be K27 acetylation demarcation of chromatin. So we're talking about active chromatin here. Um, so now that we know where it is, we want to correlate it to the 3D organization of cells uh, as they enter senescence. So to do this, we're going to use high C. I'm going to briefly introduce the idea. So the idea is that you have any two pieces of DNA that are not next to one another uh, in, uh, in, on, on the linear genome. They're actually far away, but they're brought together in a looping sort of interaction. And here you can see the, the blue and the orange bits. They're held together by some sort of a protein. So you're cross-linking DNA. You're cutting with a restriction enzyme. You're filling in the, the overhangs with uh, biotin. And then when you ligate these together and you do these ligations in situ, so where these are actually sitting, so you don't have random ligations with fragments that just happen to fly around, you can actually isolate these ligation junctions that are not, cannot be found on the linear genome, but give you sort of the frequency of interactions. So you need to sequence really deeply. Uh, and we're talking here about billions and billions of reads required for the experiments that I'm going to show you. And then you end up with maps that look like this. So I'm going to very briefly go through the, the main features of this map. So this map, um, 
present a, a, a small um, uh, three, four megabase fragment of a human chromosome. You can see here, this is the chromosome. And you can see that it has lots of signal because these are nearby fragments that were cut and re-ligated together. So this is essentially not very informative. And you can see two major features. First of all, you see these uh, squares arising where you have more signal inside the square than you have between squares. And these are famously called TADs or topologically associating domains. So these are topological domains across chromosomes that are largely not very variable between cell types and which harbor pieces of chromatin that like to interact with one another more than what they interact with other uh, pieces of chromatin in other domains. And you can also see these dots in these maps and these dots are loops. So essentially they are uh, the two anchors of a loop that come together and stabilize a loop-like structure. And they appear as dots on these maps and you can see uh, multiple ones here. So you have tabs and you have loops. And the, you know, the, the stronger the color, the more often you find them in your library. So the more often the contact should actually occur in vivo. So now if you take two maps that come out of a proliferating cell and of a senescent cell, you subtract them, you can find regions that have more interactions to senescence. These are depicted here in red and uh, regions that have fewer interactions in senescence. So they interact less frequently with one another and they are depicted here in blue. And this is a picture that you get from uh, the whole of Huber chromosome 20. And now I'm going to compare that with what happens to the same chromosome in IMA 90s and in MSCs. And I think you'll appreciate that the changes, the trends of the changes are very different, but the overall structure of the domain, so you look at this big domain here, uh, is you know, more or less the same, but the changes within the domain are very cell type specific. The same applies if we look you know, along the long arm of chromosome 13 uh, here. I should say that if you take two different donors of Huvix, for example, and you do this experiment like we've done, um, you see exactly the same changes. So the, everything it looks like it's very cell type specific here. However, and because much of this is published, I'm not going to dwell too much on this, but the whole idea is that we try to now correlate HMGB2 positioning relative to these topological domains. And what we find is that HMGB2 seems to be enriched at the boundaries of these topological domains. So if this is the breadth of the topological domains, you see that HMGB2 spikes here and there. There's quite a bit of HMGB2 within the domain, but it spikes at the two boundaries as does a very well-known uh, protein for demarcating these boundaries, CTCF, which is a, an insulator protein. And you can see here, for example, that activity marked by K27 acetylation is actually within the domain. Now, um, the same applies to our other cell type, to IMR90s. You see a very nice demarcation of the boundaries by HMGB2, uh, just like CTCF does. And then when we look at senescence, actually this demarcation is lost, which makes sense because obviously HMGB2 is not present in the senescent nucleus anymore. So is there a consequence of that? Uh, I should also say here that to our surprise, uh, HMGB2 bound positions, although they're not many across the genome, they can actually talk to one another. And um, this will come handy later on, on on how they function. So you can see here that, you know, HMGB2 bound sites form about 3000 loops with one another, um, almost 5000 loops in, in Huvex. And this, this is how loops should look, at, look like in these aggregate plots. So what happens now when we enter senescence? So generally in the field of 3D genome organization, um, TADs, are more or less considered invariable, but we're always looking for changes at the level of TADs. So depending on whom, whom you talk to, if you compare the TADs of a mouse stem cell to the TADs in a neuron that is derived from that stem cell, um, they differ you know, less than 30%. Some people say 10, 15%, other people say 20, 25, maybe 30%. If we look what happens to our TADs here in senescence, we see that about a third of TADs in Huvex remain unchanged, so the boundaries remain at the same positions. A quarter of them, so more than 600, shift one boundary, and about 40% of them actually fuse into larger TADs, which is in line with you know, what has been proposed from the Sedevi and Areti labs um, of uh, you know, condensed chromosomal arms and you know, things fusing together. Now, 
Um, if you look at how HMGB2 behaves in these subcategories of tabs, you'll find that, for example, the unchanged tabs have their boundaries demarcated by both B2 and CTCF. The, the tabs are fused together. They seem to have little demarcation by HMGB2 and quite intense demarcation by CTCF in comparison. But if you look at the ones that shift their boundaries, you find that um, they have one boundary that has more HMGB2 than CTCF and the other boundary has more CTCF than HMGB2. And what we think is happening is that you lose CTCF, uh, sorry, HMGB2 from here, and now this boundary has to shift either out or in in order to find a new position um, to be uh, located at. So if this is the case, then it means that this, this reorganization because of loss of HMGB2 might have an effect on uh, how senescence is regulated in these cells. So what we went on and did, and again, I'm not going to show you all the data because this is published, we knocked down HMGB2. And to our surprise, knocking down HMGB2 phenocopies three major effects of uh, replicative senescence entry. So first of all, if you knock down HMGB2 in either IMA90s or Huvix, you have a strong suppression of transcription, nascent transcription genome-wide, which can go up to 30%, and we see about a 10% um, suppression of transcription output in senescent cells. At the same time, when you knock down HMGB2, you have an increase in HP on alpha foci that mark um, considered heterochromatin and a decrease at the, in the levels of K27 trimethylated uh, heterochromatin, which marks facultative heterochromatin. This is exactly what happens uh, across all three cell types in senescence. You see here examples from Huvex, IMA90s and MSCs, and you see the quantification for IMA90s underneath. You see a drop in the levels of K27 trimethylation, and you see an increase and this punctate formation of HP and alpha foci. So just by knocking down one non-heterochromatic protein, actually, you can phenocopy two major effects of senescence. So the shift in the identity of heterochromatin, or let's say that maybe the quantity of heterochromatin, we haven't deciphered that yet, and also a transcriptional repression. However, what was very dramatic was the effect that HMGB2 had on CTCF. So this is a normal pair of cells here. They have HMGB2 in their nucleus. They have CDCF essentially all over the nucleoplasm. CDCF is also a very abundant protein. And then when you knock down HMGB2 or when you allow the cells to enter senescence, you see that you have a, an emptied out nucleus as regards HMGB2, and you have this focal now appearance of CDCF throughout the nucleoplasm. Um, you can now extract the diffuse pool and you actually find that these CTCF foci actually stay behind. They stay on chromatin. And because they're such nicely round shaped formations, we, we thought that they might have, the, there might be a biophysical aspect to this. And this is what we're looking into now. You can actually make them dissolve by adding this um, alcohol like um, 1.6 uh, uh, hexandiol that is supposed to you know, stop phase separation or uh, hinder it. So we now think that there are some biophysical forces that bring CTCF together somehow. We, we have not gotten to the bottom of this just yet. Um, but I, I wanna show you this picture. So this picture is a super resolution image of a proliferating cell. And I think you can appreciate that HMGB2 and CTCF, although they're very abundant, they very often are um, intertwined like this. There isn't much overlap of their signals. And this holds true when you look at the ChIP-seq profiles. HMGB2 is rarely ever next to a CDCF. They're, they're pretty well separated uh, across the genome. Now, when you look at the large senescent nuclei, I think you can clearly see that there's a loss of the red color. So HMGB2 is not there anymore. And then you have these large, very, very large uh, aggregates of CDCF, these clusters that we call uh, senescence-induced clusters, or SITs. Now, we actually used high chip to map the loops in these cells, and we found that on average, CDCF now makes these larger uh, loops, which seem to go across positions that were previously bound by HMGB2. So HMGB2 was in between, and once it's lost, you now have these large loops coming across these positions, uh, across all chromosomes and, and, and genome-wide. We find, you know, a few thousands of them. And then 
we can actually rescue the formation of this senescence induced clusters by reintroducing through a piggyback um, HMGB2 in these cells. And you can see here in the quantification that we rescue more than half of the cells that have, uh, that have uh, CDCF clusters in them. So to cut a long story short, again, because this was published, you know, it's more than two years ago, um, we have this idea that HMGB2 is sitting between positions where you have CDCF loops, which is what happens in a normal proliferating cell. And then as the cells enter senescence, you have a forced depletion of HMGB2 from the nucleus that somehow allows these new CDCF loops to, uh, to occur. And these most likely make these multi-protein uh, clusters of CDCF that seem to have this condensation-like uh, aspect to them. So this is where we stand with HMGB2 at the moment. Uh, but we've asked the same question for, for HMGB1. So what does it do? Again, HMGB1 having the same DNA binding domains as HMGB2 is a very difficult molecule to chip, um, but it has been very well characterized as regards its role outside the cell. So HMGB1 is a very prototypic pro-inflammatory extracellular stimulus. It was actually described very early on by the Bianchi lab and in the context of senescence from uh, Judith Campis' lab um, in the Davalos paper in 2014. And the whole idea is that cells take HMGB1 from the nucleus, they secrete it into their niche, and this is part of the SASP, so the secretory phenotype of senescent cells. And this is a, a nice connection between genome and secretome here. So we wanted to see what it does whilst in the nucleus. And again, we managed to chip it into different cell types, a so HUVAC and IMA 90s. Just like HMGB2, it is predominantly bound to active genes and active gene promoters. Um, we have now updated these numbers. I'm, I'm sorry that I haven't here. So we have more chip data, uh, slightly better, that give us more than two, two and a half thousand peaks uh, per each cell type. But again, the picture is the same. Uh, these positions are depleted of any heterochromatic marks. They're actually very rich in um, H3, K27 acetyl marks. So they are active uh, regions in euchromatin. And now we want to look how they, how they might demarcate topological domains. Um, there's about 20% of the peaks that we find genome-wide actually demarcate some of the boundaries of topological domains, as you can see here, the ones in magenta color. And there are other peaks that just fall within these domains. They, again, nicely follow um, the demarcation of CDCF sites, uh, left and right, and this demarcation is lost upon entry in senescence. So all is very much reminiscent of what HMGB2 does, although there is zero overlap between the positions bound by HMGB1 and the positions bound by HMGB2. They seem to be binding completely different targets in the two genomes of either HUVEX or AMA90s. And this is exemplified here. So we did the exact same thing. We took the different subcategories of TADs that either remain unchanged, shift one boundary, fuse together, or break up. And these are very few, of course. And we tried to see whether there was something that could be explained only due to H and GB1 presence at a boundary. And we couldn't. However, if we do look genome-wide at boundary peaks, you can see here, these are all the peaks in Hubex, for example. And you can see here that if you just look at all the peaks, there is no significant sort of, uh, any sort of significant topological boundary appearing. And of course, if you look at the change between senescence and proliferating cells, you don't see much change. But if you only look at this 20% of uh, boundary peaks, you actually see a very nice boundary forming. You can see red, triangles left and right and lots of blue coming down here. So this is an insulation point. So these interactions are insulated from those interactions. So these domains are well separated. And then if you look at what happens in senescence, you actually see new interactions coming in at this point, as if whatever insulation was there is now dissolved and there's new contacts forming across these positions. And these positions are marked by HMGB1 but we couldn't find what these positions were all about. So at the time, the bioinformatician in my lab, we were back in Cologne, was a mathematician. And he said, what if we can look at these domains in um, a, a different way? So he used something uh, that is called lexicographic ordering 
which does the following. It takes, it starts by assuming that your chromosome, each chromosome is partitioned into consecutive topological domains. You can see them here, one to seven. And then it measures the normalized counts of high C signal between any two of these. And of course, the highest, the, uh, the, the signal be connecting two tabs, then you assume that these are closer together in 3D space. So you can now build a network where one, two, and three are actually more interacting with one another than four, five, six, and seven. And once you build this network, uh, there is a tool, there, there's a mathematical explanation in this lexicographic ordering that can slice connections in the network that you've built up until the critical point where the network marginally does not fully collapse. So it stops there and it takes a snapshot of the network. And then it does it again, starting from another tab in the genome, and then again from another and so on and so forth, about 10,000 times. And then it returns back the average picture of this network by building little cliques or little neighborhoods, or neighborhoods of tabs coming together in 3D space. And you can depict this in a cartoon that looks like this. So this is chromosome 17 here. This is the beginning and this is the end of the chromosome. So the beginning is here, the end is there. And you can see tabs of different sizes. So the size of the circle indicates the size of the tab. You can see tabs of the same color because they belong to the same cluster. So you can see the green cluster here and then the blue cluster and the gray cluster and so on and so forth, right? And you can compare the organization in these meta clusters in proliferating cells where on average the tabs are about a megabase large and in senescent clusters where they're larger, uh, more than 1.1 megabases, which is what we expect because they fuse together, as I said before. And you can see there's a change in organization. Um, and again, in my eyes, there was nothing very interesting in this analysis. It, it verified the things we knew, but there was nothing interesting. And then Miller said, no, no, you need to look at what he was calling at the time these singular tabs. And these were tabs that were sort of coming in between the large clusters and he could identify them um, in his clustering algorithm. And I've pinpointed three of these here for you. So if you look at these singular tabs, so this is the demarcation of tabs, you know, across the genome I showed you before. This is large clusters that have at least three tabs in them. And you can see that HMGB1 actually, if anything, is depleted from the boundaries of these large clusters. And then you look at these singular clusters and HMGB1 is actually very nicely demarcating their, their borders. Now, if we look at the differentially expressed genes in these different categories, we, we can actually find that, you know, the genes that were initially interesting to us, for example, the ones uh, involved in DNA conformation changes and telomere organization and chromosome organization, they tend to be almost exclusively in the large clusters. But if you look at upregulated genes, the ones that have to do with pro-inflammatory um, responses, so response to wounding, chemotaxis, cytokine production, they are almost exclusively found in these sigla tabs demarcated by HMGB1. Now, if you go on and knock down HMGB1 in our cells, so this is data from, from Huvix in this case, you actually have a very strong induction of an inflammatory response, which is very much in line with what Judy Campisi had seen in fibroblasts. Uh, and actually uh, manipulating the levels of HMGB1, uh, HMGB1 with these uh, siRNAs actually does not affect HMGB2 at all. So you don't have the formation of CTCF clusters actually in these cells. So it seems like depletion of B1 and B2 do, do two very different things. And it's the, the sum of the two that actually brings about senescence. Um, we can actually see that these uh, senescent cells uh, actually have you know, a strong uh, SASP and, and uh, uh, um, a secretory phenotype as we would expect. And then you can look at um, genes that are in these secular tabs that are SASP related and this is, they're all strongly upregulated in senescence, but not all of them are controlled by HMGB1 because not all of them go up in the knockdown. What is even more interesting here is that of these many genes here, only six of them are directly bound at their promoters by HMGB1. However, the topological domains of all of these genes are demarcated by HMGB1. 
So we like to think that it is actually a change in topology that induces or facilitates the induction of these genes rather than the direct regulation via HMGB1. So this of course has a very interesting implication. And this implication is that you now have a very abundant nuclear protein in a proliferating cell. And these, this protein does three things at once. As you enter senescence, and you deplete this protein from the nucleus, it affects the organization of chromatin in the nucleus to induce a pro-inflammatory response. It is secreted outside the cell where it acts as a pro-inflammatory stimulus. And there's the third leg of that that I didn't have the time to talk about that actually has to do with the RNA binding capacity of HMGB1 that seems to control a network of RNAs, again, linked to the SASP and the pro-inflammatory response. So it seems to sort of put in place a secretome to genome crosstalk whereby you change the, the genome conformation and the regulation of RNA by adding a factor, a nuclear factor to the secretome. So as a summary of this, uh, there are two very discrete 3D genome functions that we're interested in. Uh, in HMGB1 and 2. So HMGB1 has to do with SASP gene activation, both inside and outside the cell, and it demarcates these singular TADs uh, that lose HMGB1 from their boundaries and uh, in some mechanism that we don't fully understand right now, activate these genes. On the other hand, HMGB2 um, seems to demarcate uh, positions that are between CTCF loops and as you move into senescence, this demarcation is lost. There's an insulatory function that goes away. And now you have these new long range CTCF loops that allow the formation of these large CTCF clusters and presumably affect also gene expression changes in general. So if this is the case, could it be that these very important factors for senescence entry, that they become relevant for cancer, for understanding cancer progression? So if you do you know, the sort of quick and dirty experiment that I did is just log on to TCGA or some large cancer data repository and ask what happens to HMGB2, for example, as regards expression, you'll find that in a number of, you know, uh, well-known cancers, lag adenocarcinomas, pancreatic adenocarcinomas, colon adenocarcinomas, it's really highly overexpressed compared to matching tissue from the GTEx, from the same tissue, uh, from normal people from the, the GTEx uh, database. Uh, and at the same time, you can actually find using the data in these repositories that the upregulation of HMGB1 or HMGB2, which you know, is rather well correlated in, in this patient data, it comes with an upregulation of genes that are typically suppressed in senescence. So lamin B1 is downregulated in senescence. It goes up with uh, HMGB1 and 2. EZH2, which uh, has to do with uh, facultative heterochromatin, is the same. SMC2 that has to do with cell division, CTCF that has to do with genome organization. So they, they seem to somehow, so their overexpression correlates well with the um, initiation of, a, of an anti-senescence gene expression program. Now, we have started looking into this and we do this by having, because we have a resource in, in the Institute of pancreatic cancer organoids. So there is a program here in Göttingen where Essentially, every patient that comes and has a resected tumor um, has a bit of that material used to create a patient-specific uh, cancer organoid. And if you look at, uh, again, at TCGA data for uh, pancreatic cancer, you find that the high versus low patients have actually uh, a very, very, uh, well, a, a pretty significant difference in survival. So the prognosis for HMGB2 high patients is, is worse than uh, that for uh, HMGB2 low patients. So we said, okay, let's start looking at this. Maybe there is something here to discover. I should really stress here that HMGBs, either B1 or B2, are not drivers of carcinogenesis. They're not, you know, KRAS or P53. They don't get mutated. They don't get amplified. It's just that Cancer entities, tumor entities, seem to really have, very often, really high levels of expression of B1 and or B2. So uh, we did a simple Western blot across our collection. This is a part of our collection, uh, which is now numbers, I think, around 50 organoids from 50 patients. And in few cases, we actually have matching normal tissue from the same patient, which is very tough to get. 
And you can see that you have different levels of B2 and B1. But I think you can appreciate that overall B2 seems to be uh, much higher than what B1 is. However, there's, there's a nice correlation between the levels of B1 and B2 uh, at the protein level after quantification. Um, and then we decided to do the following. We decided to do single cell RNA sequencing in these organoids to try and figure out whether you know, that's heterogeneity, whether every cell in this organoid does this. So in this UMAP um, scheme that you see here, every dot is a cell, a single cell. And every dot is colored according to the cluster uh, that it belongs to. And these clusters are set such because of their gene expression profile. So this pink cluster here, for example, which is this one, um, actually has a very similar gene expression profile between the genes compared to you know, the purple cluster here, for example. And you can see really different levels of expression of B2 and of B1 across the whole uh, organoid. But actually, this map that I just showed you depicts two organoids, depicts a matching pair of a cancer organoid here shown in blue and a control organoid shown in gold or whatever this ugly color is. Uh, and if I now map onto this map, the expression of HMGB2, you can find that this is very variable. So you have this cluster, which is cancer only, that has very high expression overall of B2. But you have also this cluster here, which is essentially control only, that also has quite high B2. And then you have other mixed clusters. So we're trying to understand what is going on here. Uh, the other interesting thing is that although you have a very, a much higher expression of HMGB1 across uh, the whole um, uh, population of, of these cells and these organoids, the actual expression level in the cells of the, the B1 protein is very low. And we have now found that these cells seem to be secreting this. And this goes very much in line with the pro-inflammatory niche that pancreatic cancer likes to have. And if we now, for example, compare this cluster here, which is cluster zero, that has the, you know, the most HMGB2, to uh, the average of the normal clusters here, we find that there's a significant enrichment for genes that have to do with um, uh, cell cycle progression, um, with transition through the M phase, and of course with DNA conformation um, and uh, the, uh, the organization of chromosomes. So this is very much in line with you know, the converse of what we saw in senescence. In senescence, we see a suppression of this, that most of these genes are downregulated. Here, we see that the upregulation of HMGB2 in the cancer cell coincides with an upregulation of all these processes. So the idea is maybe we can, you know, in theory, pharmacologically hit HMGBs somehow and turn these cancer cells from proliferating to senescent before we hit them with uh, some sort of normal chemotherapy to eliminate them from the patient. There exists out there, um, so this is a published molecule, so this is why I'm showing this, it's called ICM, and this was published in 2014 as a molecule that allows um, HMGB1 and 2 not to leave the cell nucleus. I, we now think that this claim is false, because when you treat um, IMA90s, for example, with ICM from three, for three to six days, not only do you have a full-fledged senescent phenotype, but you also have a loss of HMGB1, an enlarged nucleus, as you can see here, induction of P21. You have um, a downregulation of ketone 7 trimethylation. You have this punctal of HP and alpha, and you have the formation of CTCF foci. So all the hallmarks of senescence entry and HMGB2 loss from these cells. And if you actually correlate the gene expression profile with that of replicative or oncogene induced senescence, it looks very much like the induction of a replicative senescence phenotype. I should say here that what is interesting is that these cells have a very compromised SASP. So the secretory ability because of the drug is really compromised. So now we can use ICM onto a normal pancreatic organoid and see what happens. Um, Again, you see the different clusters, you see the different levels of HMGB2 here, and you can see in gold the control organoid and in blue the ICM treated. And you can see that the average levels of B2 are really, really suppressed in the ICM treated normal organoid. And then when you look at what, is, what are the major pathways affected, you really have a strong suppression of DNA conformation and cell cycle induction 
uh, in these cells. So it seems like the drug is doing exactly what you would expect it to do. It seems to be enforcing some sort of a senescent-like phenotype. We also see them slowing down just by looking at them in the well in the way they grow. So we then moved on to take an actual cancer organoid and treated with cisplatin uh, with two hours, which is a, a drug that is very commonly used in pancreatic cancer treatments in the clinic. And you can see that the organoid grows just fine for 48 hours, it really doesn't care. Or we can treat it with ICM, and you can see that very easily in this PAN35T organoid, you very easily stop the growth and you actually induce cell death into, in this um, organoid. And if you isolate live cells from this, from the treated and compared to the untreated, you actually see that you have a suppression, again, of exactly what you would expect. Cell cycle, DNA confirmation, uh, and so on and so forth. Also uh, DNA damage, autophagy, and so on and so forth. So we have a, what seems like, I, I'm not going to say it's, it's, it's an senescence, it's actually senescence-like phenotype that we're inducing in these. And we're thinking that it could be combined um, uh, with uh, actual chemotherapeutics to have an effect on patients. So this brings me to this last slide that has the, the idea that I have in my head about how these HMGBs work. So a normal cell, we have this average of one HMGB for every 10 nucleosomes in the genome, right? And it, it sits, let's say, in the normal position of the rheostat. Now, when you deplete HMGBs from these cells, so the availability becomes very low, then the cells stop proliferating and they actually become senescent. So you need the loss of B1 and B2 to be able to have a senescent cell. So low levels or zero levels of HMGB equal senescence. So low or zero levels of proliferation. But then if this cell was to escape into malignancy, you would have an increased number of HMGBs in the nucleus, most likely of these cells, and you would have a, a commensurate increase in proliferation potency. So if you were to somehow interfere with the levels of HMGB at this high setting of this rheostat, you'll be able to perhaps turn it down and really harness the, um, the, the proliferation of these cancer cells, you know, hopefully to the benefit of the patient. So I'm going to stop here. I need to thank the guys in the lab here in the natural environment, the lift, um, going down for lunch. And uh, obviously the people that have been paying the bills over the last years and lots of collaborators left and right that really help us do the, the sort of work we're trying to do. And I'm happy to take questions if there are any. Thank you, Akis. That was a really interesting talk. Um, so if anyone does have any questions, you can raise your hand uh, on the sort of Zoom function um, and I'll be able to unmute you. Um, and hopefully um, we'll, we'll, we'll have some questions from, from the chat there. So if, if we're just waiting for people to think of some questions, maybe I'll start. Um, Akis, the majority of uh, the sort of the first part of your talk was looking in replicative senescence. Um, yes. I wondered whether or not you see similar changes um, in this chromatin organization in other forms of senescence, oncogene-induced senescence, for example, where obviously the SAFs are a really clear phenotype there. No, we haven't. So first of all, we don't see the SAFs in replicative senescence. I mean, we see this HPN alpha foci, but they're not this prototypic, really strong uh, uh, self phenotype that we, we are used to from oncogene senescence. Um, the best, the, the highest resolution data uh, to date have come from Giacomo Scavalli's lab. And it, this was a paper in 2020, molecular cell, where they clearly say that um, it, when they managed to have senescent cells, but inhibit the formation of these heterochromatic foci, the changes in structure in oncogenitive senescence very much resemble those in replicative senescence, which I find you know, reasonable because much of the uh, regulation of many genes is, is very, very relevant between the two. So this is the extent that we've gone. We haven't looked at HMGBs in that context at all, so I couldn't really comment. Okay. Uh, are there any questions from the chat? Well, you mentioned that you didn't have uh, time to touch on the RNA binding role of HMGB1. So I wondered if you would you like to sort of elaborate on how that sort of how that sort of fits into this. Oh, no, we have a, we have a few we have a few ah. questions in the chat. Um, okay, we can start with those, and then I'm Juan Carlos to... Acosta. Um, I'll uh, I'll unmute you. Um, you uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hi, Aki. It's a great, great talk. Uh, Thank you. As always. 
So I have a question about, I'm very curious about this ICM drug that you found that is used in senescence, is inducing senescence. So do you, or, or something that is like senescence, mm -hmm. do, you, do you, have you tried to, to use senolytics to see if they are sensible or sensitive to senolytics? We haven't. Uh, this is the, we're going to try and do it. We have also not used it in vivo yet. So we've just gotten the permission to use it in a mouse uh, to see if it does in vivo what it does in vitro. It is, you know, it's a horrible drug because it works in the, in the, uh, in the micromolars, uh, but it's enough to do yeah. one drug test. Yeah, I mean, because people is uh, trying to find these two punch. Uh, yes, yes. I think that that would be very interesting to see if this is kind of, even I if should... it's not the senescence phenotype, if it is something that is... It is something similar. It's slowing them down in some manner or other. I should say that we have actual patient-derived cells um, from uh, people that have, uh, oh God, um, uh, B-cell lymphomas. And there the dependency is on HMGB1 and not HMGB2. And if you treat those uh, cells with uh, ICM, they will go into apoptosis within less than a day. So it's, the effect is just amazingly strong there. But it is the cancer that has the highest levels of HMGBs to any other cancer in the TCGA. So this, it seems to be also commensurate to how much HMGBs you have because somehow the cells become addicted to them. Um, so it seems like in some cases it might even be good enough by itself. Cool, thanks, thanks. Uh, we have Tybalt. Uh, hopefully, you can. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, yeah, thank you uh, for this presentation. And my question is about actually about a paper that I've read read recently, where they did a conventional ablation of HMGB1 in uh, young mice. So HMB, HMGB1 was not expressed anymore in the liver. So according to this result and the war of HM, HMGB1, should we expect that maybe they, these mice would age faster and would show uh, thing, uh, signs of uh, senescence in their cells? Um, my guess would be yes. So the problem is, and I, I encountered, I, I had a grant review recently and you know the reviewers were all going on about um, the HMGB1 knockout mouse is, embryonic lethal, mm -hmm. the HMGB2 knockout mouse is born and it's not embryonic lethal. And it, uh, the, the main effect that it has, it has some problems in the joints and it has, uh, a, it's not fertile. So the reviews were going on about, well, B2 cannot be very important, for example, because you know the mouse is born, but B1 is super important because it dies. I don't think this is the case. I think it's very cell time specific. So we need to see whether B1 is you know more important in the liver than B2 or whatever. I guess that if you, uh, let the mice go for enough time, which no one has done to date. It's also an expensive experiment. Let them grow and go into mid-age or so. You should be able to see accumulation of senescent cells in both models would be my guess. But no one has done it to date. And, you know, we're not a, a mouse lab, so I don't have data on that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so we have Eric Gilson. Hopefully uh, you should be able to unmute yourself. Okay, do you hear me? Yeah, yeah. So uh, my question is, uh, first of course, uh, thank you for your talk. So the question is about the down regulations that you have of B1 and B2 during replicative senescence. Do you have any idea about what is upstream and uh, what is the negative regulator of the expression of your gene? Yeah, that is a very good question. And I'm, I'm surprised that no one had answered it up until now. We haven't either very well. Um, so I can tell you two things that we know. We have not mechanistically done this carefully. We know two things. Uh, first of all, we have a loss of uh, E2F factors that seem to bind the promoters of both B1 and B2. Uh, and because these are down-regulated upon senescence entry, the loss of, uh, of these factors there actually result in, in down-regulation. It's the converse in cancer. So in lymphoma, um, E2F1 and E2F6 are, are highly expressed and they seem to be driving some of the expression of at least HMGB1. And we also see a change in methylation, um, both at the promoter and at the proximal uh, regulatory elements of both B1 and B2. And we think that this hypermethylation there locally might be uh, affecting transcription factors from binding and thus silencing gene expression. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Okay, are there any more questions from the chat? I think all these ones have already been. Well, if not, then I think uh, all that's left to say is thank you once again to Akis for a, a really lovely uh, talk. Um, and for everyone uh, who's, who's been waiting for the next, the next talk, which will be our final one, um, that will be on March the 11th. Um, so I hope, to, I hope to see you all there too. Um, so thank you once again, Akis. And, Good. Uh, thank, thank you, you so much. For, thank you, everybody, for coming. Bye-bye.